name is Jonathan Kawaguchi. I am a high school senior and an Eagle Scout in the city of Los Angeles. Today, I got to spend some time getting to know a man who I have admired, Chief Terry Hara with the Los Angeles Police Department. Throughout his career, he has been a great community leader and I wanted to know more about him. Uh, thank you, Chief Hara, for talking with me today. Hey, you're welcome. You're a deputy chief. What does that mean and what are you responsible for? A deputy chief on the Los Angeles Police Department is one of the senior executives. Uh, we have a chief of police, which there's only one. Mm -hmm. Then we have three assistant chiefs and eight deputy chiefs. And the eight deputy chiefs are responsible for a bureau office. In my case, it's personnel and training bureau. So I have all of training within LAPD mm -hmm. from recruits to in-service, which covers about 10,000 employees. And then the other side that we have are in-service, and then we also take care of the HR side, the personnel side, mm -hmm. our records, our medical liaison. So it keeps me busy. It keeps me busy from the standpoint of, of managing all the personnel within LAPD mm -hmm. um, day to day. That sounds like a lot of work. How do you manage your time? You have a lot of good people. Uh, you trust your people. The people that report to me directly that will give me daily briefings uh, and provide me some information as to how things are going. Uh, if there are some very, very important issues that need to be addressed, they'll bring it to my attention. But for the most part, uh, I'm very fortunate to have a great staff, and, and through them, we were able to get things done. What were the steps that you had to go through to get to where you are? Uh, it starts really from, I think, from day one. When I joined the LAPD in 1980, uh, even get, before getting onto the department, I was a police explorer with the city of Long Beach. They, it introduced me to police work. I went out on ride-alongs with officers, got to know about policing in general, and, and it was something that interests me greatly. But coming onto the department was one of my dreams, uh, watching uh, the One Adam 12 series, the Dragnet series, probably the best recruitment tool for anybody to join the police department. But through those years, taking exams, uh, whether it's for a police officer, going to the academy, uh, having different assignments, taking the next exam for a training officer or supervisor being a sergeant, and then working various assignments. Within LAPD, over the 30, 31 years, I've worked uh, undercover, posing as a high school student, as a narc, uh, to working regular patrol, walking the footbeat. From the sergeant, uh, I, I was able to experience working different assignments from use of force to being a field supervisor to even being an adjunct to a commander. So where you get your administrative experience, the political side and understanding city hall and meeting with different uh, community members and, and city officials. Then there's another test you take. Mm -hmm. and You take, take another test for lieutenant. And a lieutenant's role is a bit more of a mid-management role. When you get promoted to lieutenant, you go back out to the field again and then you're leading a watch, a whole patrol watch. And then after that, there's another exam for a captain's exam. And then as a captain, uh, my first assignment was at Wilshire, mid-city, in the city of Los Angeles. And I was a commanding officer of our detectives. Uh, they did investigations, homicides, and robberies, and, and child abuse, and juvenile crimes, and, and auto thefts. And then from that assignment, I was assigned to a specialized division, which was probably one of my m most uh, enjoyable uh, experience as a commanding officer, and that was Detective Support Division. Mm -hmm. I had the bomb squad, and this happened uh, at that time at the 9-11, had Asian crimes, investigating crimes against the Asian community, criminal conspiracy, which involved hate crimes and, and uh, church burning arsons. Mm -hmm a fugitive warrants, people who were running away from the law that had a warrant for their arrest. I had a team to go out and capture those that are, were wanted. And then I also had uh, a specialized division of special investigation section. Uh, these are specially trained officers that are undercover tracking the violent criminals, kidnappers, uh, robbery suspects, things alike. But after captain level, there is another rank called commander. I became a commander uh, over the training aspect of the Department of Training Group. Mm -hmm. uh, as a commander, uh, I brought in a new training format that we still do today, reformatted our academy training, how our officers are taught 
a problem, adult learning, problem-based learning. So I think that's the, the most effective way to teach our young adults to become a police officer, how to shoot, tactics, and, mm -hmm. and just human relations aspect of policing. Then becoming an employee relations administrator for the chief of police, then Chief Bratton, I was his representative for labor. I represented management and always worked with labor unions to solve some of the issues and concerns that they had. And I think from that regard, uh, being able to listen, being able to communicate, and being able to agree to disagree on issues was important. And it, it allowed the department to still have a very healthy relationship with labor, as well as ensuring that the interests of the organization uh, and management was also protected. I understand that you used to be a motorcycle officer. What was that like? Yes, I was a motorcycle officer, wrote those tickets and used the radar. And unfortunately, I did issue a, a few citations uh, but And I was on there for a very short period of time. Uh, riding motors was one of the uh, fun jobs, if you will. Uh, you know, I was able to do presidential escorts and, and uh, do a lot of uh, good things on traffic enforcement, traffic flow. But more recently, in recent years, uh, you know, I, I ended up leaving the motors over 21 years ago. But then I asked to go back on motors as a deputy chief officer, which has never been done in the past. I got promotion, permission from uh, then Chief Bratton. He says, absolutely, going back on motors. And so I did. And uh, I had to go back to motor school, a reintegration. Uh, and, and the motors have changed. I started with a Kawasaki, and now it's a Harley Davidson. And then we also have BMWs. So Chief Har, is this your motorcycle? Uh, this is my motorcycle. It's my pride and joy. It's custom painted by the motor shop that built the bikes here. It was a surprise when I made deputy chief and went back on motors, uh, given to me in honor of being the first chief officer on LAPD to be back on a motorcycle. So it's custom painted and when I'm out on the streets, the motor officers know that this bike, they know it's Chief Hara riding because there's no other bike on the department painted like this. But also it's a morale booster. Uh, I'll ride it with the parade drill team I also use it on special circumstances like the Sunshine Kids come to visit LAPD for a day and we'll take them out, escort them throughout the city. It's something that's very, very special to me. It's 21 years ago I was on motors and to go back on motors and to show the troops that management supports them for all the work they do out there is just outstanding. When you were young, you were influenced by TV shows. Do you think now that these TV shows are realistic. Uh, an everyday officer's job is driving out in the streets and probably 90% of the time is driving in the streets. It's not the chasing after the bad guy or getting in the shooting. Some officers will never pull their gun to shoot. Most officers will never. But you do hear in the news when it becomes an, a newsworthy event about officers getting involved in the shooting mm -hmm. or officers getting hurt uh, or a robbery and a pursuit. You know, we've seen those helicopters out in the sky and following pursuits. But overall, it's very, very few. And so for the most part, when you see a reality TV show, they're capturing those moments that are just unique at that time in policing, when generally it's, it's pretty calm. So what made you want to become a police officer? You know, I think it started very, very young uh, from even elementary school, looking back, elementary school, middle school, junior high school back then, in high school, I was always involved in helping others, uh, volunteering, being part of a service club, such as in middle school, I was a junior optimist. Uh, today it's uh, the Joy Club, Junior Optimist uh, International. In high school it was the Kiwanis Club or Key Club, mm -hmm. a lot of service-based. I always enjoyed helping others, and I, I told myself, you know, why not get paid for it? Why not get paid and, and be a public servant, be a police officer, and still help people? Uh, I think it's always been in my blood to do that, always to give back. And even today, as an adult, as being a representative in the police department, I'm ever more active, more so today, of being a volunteer in the community and trying to make a difference as a as a much larger 
uh, influence in changing the community and influence the community. Are you from the Los Angeles area? I have uh, born and raised in Long Beach, uh, still live in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hara family is pretty much from the Long Beach area. I have relatives in the South Bay uh, area as well. Uh, but uh, growing up, my father, uh, he worked hard. Uh, my father worked seven days a week. He, he first uh, was a fisherman and then uh, our family is from the Terminal Island. Uh, there's a story about the Terminal Islanders uh, of a small community about 3,000 before the war. Uh, it was a fishing town. Uh, they worked in the canneries. Uh, and after World War II broke, a lot of the uh, residents were evacuated. In fact, all of them were evacuated and put into concentration camps. Mm -hmm. uh, my father uh, was a fisherman, and then uh, and then he eventually moved on to work in the retail or the grocery industry, mm -hmm. and one of, was one of the produce managers for a major uh, food chain store, grocery store. Uh, but uh, you know, we still live in Long Beach, and uh, our relatives in Long Beach, um, and it's although most of my time is spent in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the community work, and obviously my, my profession here is in the city. Uh, the city of Los Angeles offers such a great opportunity for me personally, uh, meeting with so many different people, so many different communities. The communities, many of them, are first generation coming in from another country to make Los Angeles their home. And we see this as an opportunity for our department that as diverse as the city is, and as many cultures that come in, they bring their experience from their country about policing and think that it's very similar here in Los Angeles or in the United States, and it's not. Policing is very different. We're very community-oriented, very public relations, community policing-oriented. We want the community to get to know their officers better. Mm -hmm. We want to help the community and involve ourselves to help with community projects. You'll see officers out there uh, involved in community-based work, whether it's cleanup or painting or repairing and things of that nature. Uh, so I think f uh, in regard to policing and, and uh, for me in general, uh, Los Angeles has given me the greatest opportunity to get experience of meeting so many great people doing a lot of great things. It's, it's just been a wonderful, a wonderful career here on the LAPD. What are you involved in with the community? My involvement with uh, the community is quite extensive. Uh, being involved in the Japanese American Optimist Club as their uh, past president and current board member. It's a service-based organization putting on a number of different events for uh, various communities to the Nisei Week Foundation, being president of that, uh, where 100% of the participants are all volunteers, mm -hmm. celebrating the second generation and what they have to offer, putting on the parade in Little Tokyo during August. I'm also involved with the Go For Broke National Education Center uh, that uh, talks about the story about the World War II veterans in which their families were interned during World War II, but yet they joined the United States Army to show that they were very much an American and fought for the country that incarcerated their families. And a, and a lot of history and, and a, lot, a lot of successes from those group of men, uh, a story that, that, that is told and should never be forgotten. And I'm also very involved with, with Japan America Society. And that's a society that's over 100 years old. Uh, it, it is a society where you have uh, Japanese businesses as well as U.S. businesses come together to bridge their relationship, to strengthen their relationship so that there is a continuing working relationship uh, part with, with Japan as well as with the United States. And through all those different types of organizations, you network, you meet with people, you, you get to know individuals, and, and together collectively you make a difference. You make it better for the community and you encourage other people to help join the efforts of the organization. I think one of my goals, being able to speak at different organizations, is to encourage our young, like yourself, to continue to remain involved, remaining involved by volunteering. Everyone's busy, uh, everyone has school, work, but we can also make time to volunteer ourselves, to give back to the community, because without volunteerism, 
without giving back and you have nonprofits in their roles and funding, but you need the volunteer side to help make this large machine work. Uh, where did you get your enthusiasm to be so involved in the community? It's just something that I enjoy. And, and that's why I think I've, I've done well in the policing arena, the policing profession, because it is people oriented to go out there. And, and when I was in a police car, answering radio calls, or even issuing a ticket, I would have people say thank you after I gave them a citation. And then they, they would say, why am I thanking you? You just gave me a ticket. And I tell them, you're thanking me because I'm being professional and being able to explain why and what happened and you're thanking me for the service. And usually they go, you're right. <laughs> you know. But it, 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 it's, it's a profession that I enjoy. It's a people profession. It's or, you know, uh, being, being, just being people oriented. Uh, I just love being around people. So Jonathan, we're in Little Tokyo, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, it's, I consider it my backyard. You know, I'm involved with a lot of different communities, uh, the businesses here, I get to know a lot of people. And as you can see, it's, it's vibrant. There's a lot of people here. Businesses are, are open. Uh, it's, a, it's a community that is small, yet continues to thrive. And Little Tokyo is my second home. And right before us is the Yagoda, the fire tower. The original was made out of wood, and it, over the years, it had uh, weakened and rotted out. But it was replaced with a steel structure like this. And during the opening ceremony, I mentioned to the crowd that the fact that it's made out of steel, it is now a tower that is not only an icon for Little Tokyo, but will last for decades to come, and that it will ensure, ensure its permanency here in an area that has a lot of rich culture, a fire tower watching over Little Tokyo for us for many, many years. How did your parents influence you? You know, my, my parents, uh, are typical second generation. Uh, they're very quiet, uh, very private. Uh, I think uh, their way of life has influenced me because uh, I think it's very, very important that that, that respect that we give other people um, is based upon the respect that, uh, that I got from them and, and how I uh, police as well as manage and lead others is from that respect that, that I learned from both my parents. Uh, very, very typical second generation though. They didn't talk much about their private lives mm. until now. Uh, and f unfortunately, my father passed away soon after I, I joined the police department. But to hear and to sit down and speak with my mother and some of the stories that they, uh, they have and the experience that, that they went through, you look back and you reflect that, wow, you know, we are today very, very fortunate of what we have and what we're able to do compared to you know, our parents' experience. What are some achievements that you're proud of today? I'd say one would be uh, one of the highlights that, that I will never forget it was a community-based organization. It was under the title of a, it was a federal program called the Weed and Seed. I was a captain at Southeast in South Los Angeles area, the Watts area. And we had a summer youth program that we wanted to put together. Uh, people said that it couldn't be done. We had only 90 days to put it together. Mm -hmm. I got a community member uh, and, and made him a, a focal point because he had the relationships with the community in different areas uh, to work in. But we put people together, the community, churches, banks, schools, nonprofits, and people would say, it can't be done. We're not gonna do it in 90 days, but we did. Uh, and as a result, uh, we, we were able to support over 450 at-risk youths. We were able to provide them with some educational programs for high school, some banking uh, of savings accounts and things of that nature. And during that period of time, crime went down, both in property crime and violent crime. Uh, and it was because the youth, the community was kept busy. Was it enough? No. But, but it was something to show how important it is that every community needs the ability to have resources so that people can be employed, people can work, 
and, and they, they can earn uh, uh, some, some sort of income. Uh, along with that, though, we also started a basketball league, the Moonlight Basketball League, which I believe is still uh, today, it still does exist, and I was able to throw out the first basketball. And the first game was playing against LAPD and the community, mm -hmm. and it was, a, a, it was a packed house. <laughs> we lost, LAPD uh, lost. But the important thing wasn't the game itself, but it was coming together, both the police department and the community. Uh, another area uh, that I recall is uh, a, a recent, uh, a few years ago, we had a, a terrible incident where uh, an individual, one of our officers, uh, hit an individual with a flashlight. It was a Stanley Miller incident that we referred to. As a result, the LAPD changed and created a new flashlight for our officers out in the field instead of having a, a metal, large metal flashlight, we created a, a smaller plastic, more efficient, and more state-of-the-art equipment for our officers so they don't have to carry it in their hand. They can carry it on their duty belt or in their pocket. These are the two flashlights. One, the bottom one is the old LAPD flashlight. It's much heavier. It's made out of metal. It weighs about 20 ounces. And the new one is a polymer uh, plastic type flashlight uh, that is half its weight it is an LED technology, so it's state of the art. And the uniqueness about this flashlight, the design, it has eight sides, so it won't roll. It also has two different flashlight switches, so it's like a three-way switch, so officers can use, use it in a tactical situation or just a standard flashlight. I understand that you're the chairman of the board at the Los Angeles Police Museum. Can you tell me more about that? Well, the Los Angeles Police Museum is a location, which is actually a refurbished old police station in the Highland Park area. Uh, we have displays there to show uh, the history of LAPD. Jonathan, here at the Police Museum, uh, we're here at a display of police revolvers that were used many, many years ago. And over time, the service weapons has changed, both from a revolver to a semi-automatic. Semi in the display case here, it shows the uniform styles that were used many, many years ago on our department, as well as badges, samples of badges. As you can see over the years, the shapes, the colors, the type of materials have changed uh, to the exact type of badge that we use today that I'm wearing, more of the, the oval shape badge. We also have displays here of all the handcuffs uh, the different types of handcuffs that were used and some that are actually you know were illegal but the museum provides an opportunity for our guests to see what types of police equipment as well as other types of artifacts that were out there that police came into contact with. How has being Japanese American influenced your work? Many of the uh, people were looking out from out looking in sees Japanese as much more conservative, Japanese Americans, being quiet, being reserved, not taking chances. And, and I think little, some of that is changing uh, over time. Uh, but I still hold within myself being that conservative natured individual, being a person at, uh, at meetings where I'll speak up only if it's necessary for me to, to make a comment. But for the most part, I'll remain quiet, and I'm listening, I'm absorbing and taking, it, taking things in. And I think that kind of reflects the Japanese American um, culture and, uh, and just how we you know, kind of do our business of uh, being involved in managing. Uh, but being quiet should not be a sign or perceived as a, as a sign of weakness because it's not. It's a sign of strength. It's a sign of strength that, that you're looking at and, and uh, you're aware of a lot of things that are going on where you might otherwise not be aware of if you're always talking. So what would you say to encourage young people like me? My message to you, the young adults coming up, is to be proud of who you are. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. Don't let anyone hold you back. You know, believe in what you want to do. Know that the opportunity is there. Be proud of who you are. And, and being Japanese-American, uh, my office is set so that 
without question, when someone comes in, they can see I'm Japanese. <laughs> I'm Japanese, but yet I'm also a Los Angeles police officer. The flags, the samurai sword, uh, the different cultural uh, artifacts here representing who I am, but also representing that I'm also a member of the Los Angeles Police Department. There's histories that's been made of the successes, the sacrifices, the courage, uh, a lot of, of history and a lot of things to be proud of, of being Japanese American, you shouldn't forget. Learn about it, become involved in the community, give back to the community. We're always looking for, for the young adults to get involved, whether it's in public service, whether it's in community-based organizations, whether it's just being there to help and being there involved, being that voice, that voice of reason. Be active. Be active and help others. I guess that's my best advice to give to the youth today because we're so busy, whether it's with our electronics um, and, and so engrossed in so many things that are going on, we have to kind of step back and say, okay, what can I do? for the greater good of, of the larger, for the larger good of society. And my response is give. Give of yourself. Give the time of yourself to others so that you can improve society and improve the community through your work. Meeting with Chief Terry Hara was inspiring for me. I learned that being a police officer is much more than just chasing bad guys. It's about being a community leader and building the kind of trust and respect that Chief Har has done throughout his career.